Leonard? Yes, uh, tell him. Hello? Yes, tell him. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. And you can see me, I hope, as well. Yes, My camera OK? Yes, your camera okay. is working well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Okay, welcome to today's webinar. And uh, we will uh, go ahead and uh, start this great webinar. So please feel welcome to the NBDF, Nile Basin Development Forum, the sixth one. And uh, this is a webinar under the stream of transboundary wetlands management. And the title of this webinar is Economic Valuation of Wetlands Ecosystem Services. Uh, in this webinar, we will be struggling to answer some of these questions or deal with some of these issues. One of which is how can valuation of wetlands and water related ecosystem services be mainstreamed into the river basin planning and therefore be part of the development agenda or development of options for the envisaged Nile Basin Wetlands Framework Plan. So feel most welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. And then of course, we are also going to see how we can mainstream these ecosystem services in the investments agenda into this, uh, in the investment agenda of, uh, of the wetlands uh, development uh, plans of the wetlands development agenda within uh, the Nile Basin. So I'm your host, uh, Leonard Aquan, and uh, I will be assisted by Joan Carlos, who is from uh, GIZ. And this webinar, we are co convening it with the UNEP, the Ecosystem Services Economic Unit. So we have lined for you some very insightful, very interesting presentations. One of which is a presentation from Monica Lopez from UNEP, presenting their work on agri cultural food systems and the mapping of the ecosystem services of the same. We have also lined up for you a presentation from Mr. Philip Otieno. Philip is a doctoral student at the University of Nairobi and also was one of the researcher in COCTECO wetlands economic valuation study. So he'll be sharing some of the wonderful results he has generated from this study. Then we'll also have a presentation from Mr. Telly Eugene Telly is uh, the immediate uh, former uh, deputy director at the Victoria Basin Commission. He is an environmental economist, and uh, he is also one of the researchers who uh, did a study on Semliki Delta, mapped the ecosystem services of Semliki Delta, and we will be giving a presentation in that regard. Then we have Professor Haman uh, Musahara. Professor Haman Musahara is a former lecturer at uh, the University of Rwanda, and he did a study on Rueru Bugesera wetland, and he will be sharing that presentation. Rueru Bugesera wetland is between Rwanda and Burundi in the larger Akagera River system. And then we will have a presentation from Dr. Dawit Mulatu Wobushet on Mashar Marsh's uh, economic valuation. Uh, 
Dr. Bawit is a researcher on economic uh, valuation and works with the Ethiopian uh, Research Institute and is also a lecturer at uh, Makele University in Ethiopia. And then we'll have a presentation on Sud wetland, economic evaluation of Sud wetland by Dr. Jamal Ahmed Tadesse, who is a researcher uh, with the Ethiopian Research Institute and also a lecturer, <coughs> assistant lecturer. At and then we will have a presentation from Roland Treitler on the financing mechanism to protect ecosystem services. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, works with GIZ, works with GIZ, and also works with GIZ, and also uh, teaches at the universities in uh, Asia, and has got a lot of experience uh, working on ecosystem services evaluation. And then we will have uh, a closing uh, a remark, a wrap up and key messages from uh, Juan Carlos, who is my colleague uh, from uh, GIZ. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. We have lined for you very wonderful and insightful presentations. And uh, without much ado, I will take uh, this time to invite our first uh, presenter. Uh, in this case, uh, we will uh, we will start with the first, we will start with the case studies presentations and we'll have the first presentation uh, from Mr. Philip Otien. So Philip, share your slide, please. Ah, sorry for that. Uh, kindly, I request Patrick to upgrade Monica Lopez to the panelist. And then that presentation, please, uh, sorry, Philip, let's have the introductory presentation from Monica Lopez. I didn't see him uh, log in. Sorry for that, please. So let's have the first presentation from Monica Lopez of UNEP. Monica, please. Uh, feel free to upload uh, your presentation. Sorry for that. Small, uh, okay, please, I can see Monica. So please uh, kindly upload your presentation. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. I'm sorry for the mishap with entering the session. I am not able to share my screen, and that's due to the, um, the, that I don't have the, the Zoom latest version. The fact that we're not in the office, we're not allowed to upgrade it. So I'm not able to share my screen. I okay. sent it to the address. I'm sorry for this. I wonder if, as you had initially done, the first person can present first. And then once we are sure that you have received my presentation, you could share it on my behalf. Is that possible? Okay, yeah, for purposes of uh, saving time, let's have Philip. Philip, I hope you will be understanding with us. So Philip, please, we have your presentation and then Monica will present after this. So Philip, let's have your presentation and thank you. Philip, thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, so put it on the view. Yeah, okay, good. Philip, have it. The floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. My name is Philip Putieno, and I did economic evaluation for Sio Steco wetland. It is a transboundary wetland between Kenya and Uganda, near Busia County in Kenya and the Busia District in Uganda. So th that's the outline of my presentation. Philip, can you make it on the view screen? Yeah, that one. 
Thank you so much. So I will present the overall goal of the study, the approach and the methodology that was adopted, the linkages between the ecosystem services and uh, the economic vis-a-vis -vis the stakeholders who are basically the direct beneficiaries in this case. And then the estimate of the baseline or current economic value of the wetland ecosystem. And then I'll also present to you the economic consequences of the ecosystem change in the wetland and the distributional effects of the potential management strategies that could be used to manage the wetland. So the overall goal of the study was basically to conduct an economic evaluation as a way of informing investment plans to manage the wetland. And the specific objectives for this included the identification of the COC Teco wetland ecosystem services. As you may know, that there are numerous ecosystem services and uh, time constraints may not allow full valuation of the full spectrum. And therefore, there was need to narrow down to priority ecosystem services and the beneficiaries. So that was the first objective. And then the second one was to then estimate their current values. In this case, 2019 was the baseline year that the study was pegged on. And then to identify the economic assessment cost and the benefits of potential management options. And then to compare this cost and the benefits for various management options. So those are the four specific objectives that were lined up for this study. The approach and methodology that was adopted. is a map of the lower system subcatchment. There's a ring that is green in color. That was the area that was delineated as having direct influence over the wetland in terms of interact human interactions and the wetland. On the other side were the population that were sampled or were studied. In Uganda, we, we used the word parishes and in Kenya, we used sublocations. So there's a long list that you can see. The total population for the area that was mapped out was 157,000 represented by 31,000 households. The status of the wetland as a time of evaluation is that it was 80% reclaimed majorly for crop farming. So I will skip this. This is just an outline of eight steps that were adopted. We had the first step was situation analysis, hereby described as understanding the context. Then we went to identifying the ecosystem services, describing the linkages that I mentioned earlier, and then narrowing down to the boundaries and the equations. And then there was the process of selecting the evaluation methods based on the ecosystem services and data availability. And then we proceeded to collecting and analyzing the data and setting up the baseline values or stating the baseline values and the baseline year, and then demonstrating how the various options will affect the human interactions or the ecosystem change in, within the wetland. So this is the data collection method. And the first methods were interviews and FGDs at the scoping stage, that is uh, knowing which ecosystems to value, the boundaries and the stakeholders. And this was done basically for the all of the ecosystem services. Then the actual data collection involved a number of methods. So one was market price method, which used secondary data and household surveys and largely for provisioning ecosystem services. That is the goods, the products that you can get hold of by hand. Then we had biodiversity ecosystems function, which we used CVM, contingent evaluation method through household survey. Another priority ecosystem service based on, on uh, the earlier process of scoping was groundwater recharge and water purification. And there we used replacement method coupled with secondary data. Then we had flood attenuation. Here we used damage cost avoided and the value transfer from secondary data in a study conducted in Uganda. So these are basically now the human interactions with the ecosystem services and the benefits that they drive thereof. Crop farming majorly provide local subsistence income, nutrition, 
and of course uh, saving on cost of buying those products or produce from the market. And we found that 47% of households carry crop farming within the wetland. And among them, they grow maize, arrowroot, chewing cane, vegetable rice, beans, and others. Sand harvesting was an economic, economic activity in the wetland. It provided employment and also income. More than 12% of the household they engage in sand harvesting. Aquaculture, providing income and employment, and around 1.4% of the household engage in aquaculture, that is a farming of fish within the wetland area. Bricks making was also an economic activity taking place within the wetland. There was debate whether this should be valued or not because it was viewed as not being a destructive way, but still, as far as the local community is concerned, it's a source of livelihood from the wetland. So we included it in this study. And they derive income and employment from it. More than 2,000 or 8% of the households reported to be engaging in brick making in one way or another. Then we have herbal medicine. A number of plants are used to provide education in the local community. And 16% of households reported that they either administer herbal medicine or depend on herbal medicine from herbalists being drawn from the wetland. Mat making was also an economic activity and ecosystem service in this case, which people depended on in terms of local income and employment. Then 16% of the households reported that they engaged and benefit from mat making in, from the wetland. Wellwood collection. 20% of households reported that they collect fuel wood from the area demarcated as wetland area. And this, with this, there's cost avoided for purchasing other fuels. And they also they use the fuel wood for enriching food. We have grass cutting, which was a very common ecosystem service that people depended on in terms of harvesting grass to sell or to, to do touching. Number of stuff like uh, Feeding, uh, feeding animals, selling them, and even use, using some of them for fishing. And 24% of the households wanted to engage in, in grass cutting. Livestock grazing, grass cutting sometimes was used for zero grazing. Then we have livestock grazing, those who take their cattle look the fields within the wetland. And we had over 57% of households conducting grazing in the wetland. Now this saved them alternative sources of quail or pasture and feed stock for their cattle. The animal themselves provided the social security to them. Capture fisheries, that is harvesting fish within the wetland. This time around, not aquaculture, but direct harvesting of fish within the wetland. Now the wetland drains into the Lake Victoria and is considered as one of the top four most important breeding sites of fish in Uganda. And 27% of households reported that they engage in capture fisheries. Domestic water supply, and more than 26,000 households out of 31,000 that were considered to have direct influence of the area reported to draw water directly for either cooking, washing from the wetland. Other benefits or ecosystem services included flood attenuation, and 2,000 households stand to benefit from flood problems from the wetland. Groundwater recharge, 4,000 households directly benefit from ground harvesting or obtaining water from ground water sources. Biodiversity maintenance, 27,000 households out of 31 reported that they would support biodiversity conservation initiatives. And biodiversity here, refers to the diversity of plants and animals that have global significance or are globally threatened. Lastly, the last ecosystem service that was valued was water purification. And here, because of lack of data, we only focused on turbidity. And 26,000 households reported that they engage in, again, depending on clean water from the wetland in one way or another. So let me now present to you the economic values of the ecosystem services. As I mentioned earlier, the baseline year was 2019. We valued 15 ecosystem services and their total value is 28 million USD per year. 
This graph here is a presentation of the contribution of each of, of the ecosystem services as part of the entire package that was valued. And the capture fisheries, as you can see, has the highest contribution in terms of economic value at 24%, followed by livestock grazing, sand harvesting, and the least was flood at the division. The, the area appears not to be so much prone to flooding. So these are now the aggregate figures for each ecosystem service, totaling to 28 million. This other column is about the households who benefited or the acreage that was in use. And this is basically the gross value per household. This other column that you can see there. So if we try to make sense of the baseline economic world, the economic values of this wetland ecosystem services, then we found that from an economic perspective, there are certain ecosystem services or livelihood sources that are economically undesirable. They bring negative returns if, if you factor in all the factors including time. This include growing of maize within the wetland and beans, livestock grazing, access of water, drawing water from the wetland for domestic use, bricks making and mat making. If, if we factor in all the factors involved in production and largely what here we are talking about labor that was being supplied from family or household labor being supplied and was not being costed as a factor of production. If we, if we assess the number of man hours they spend and put a dollar value on them, then for these ecosystem services, there is a negative return. So th this graph basically describes what I'm talking about. The graphs that point downwards and the negative ones can see livestock grazing, water supply, domestic use, brick making, mat making. Crop making is up, but that is basically the harder ones like chicken and arrowroot are the better values. So they have taken the overall aggregate up, but this individual crop farming, there are certain that are negative. Sand harvesting as the highest uh, return for that. So if I present to you the economic consequences of the ecosystem change, we identified some of the drivers of, of change within the wetland, and this included encroachment of exploitation. Population growth was a contributor as far as the interviews, the stakeholder engagement was. Urbanization, the wetland borders Busia town in both Kenya and Uganda. Then we have poverty and pollution emanating from crop farming and from the towns. Three scenarios were identified. The scenarios here are basically the potential management strategies for managing the wetland. One is the business as usual. That is the way business is being done now, the current scenario. And then there is a proposed wetland management plan we are calling it here conservation and wise use scenario. Then we also explored the more the usually tempting way of harnessing the wetlands, that is agricultural intensification. That was also considered as one of the management strategies. And this is uh, how each strategy panned out to be. Under business as usual, the current drivers of land use and land use change, of course, will persist. That basically is, is a constant follow of them as to whether some of them will be admitted will now depend on each, uh, on each of the strategies. So the general trend as things are based on literature review is that there is an annual rate of 4% degradation within the wetland. Population growth, of course, will continue. Then demand for housing with uh, housing materials based on population growth and urbanization will also put pressure. We, we used a net present value approach to do a cost benefit analysis. And we factored in a 25 year planning horizon and used a 10% discount rate. And the net present value for business as usual in terms of benefit was USD 193 million. And the cost of allowing the status quo to persist that the cost here we basically consider the exploitation of the wetland resources above regeneration rate. We tease them out as cost, and that yields 
359 USD, 359 million USD. Overall, the business as usual scenario will yield a net present value of 166 if we subtract uh, benefits from the cost. And that has uh, a cost benefit ratio of 0.54. So this, this graph shows how the cost and the benefits and the business as usual scenario will, will turn out to be in the next coming years. Under conservation and waste use scenario, it's a proposed management plan and it has a number of strategic objectives, which include promoting conservation of the wetland ecosystem and its catchment, promoting and supporting ado adoption of sustainable sources of livelihoods for the local population, and supporting the establishment and strengthening of governance structures. The benefits that will accrue over the next 25 years, a net pre a present value for that, for present value of the benefits is 209 mm -hmm. USD million. The Could cost. You two minutes. Yes. You have two Pardon? minutes. Please, you have oh. two minutes to finish. Okay. Let, let, let me. And the cost will be 44 USD million. The net present value is 165 million, and it has a cost benefit ratio of 4.75 dollars. Agricultural intensification will have a net present value benefit of 295 USD and a benefit cost ratio of 3.19. Now it's important to note that even though the agricultural intensification scenario has the highest net present value in terms of benefit, there are a number of externalities that were not considered due to data and data availability. And so, we advise that uh, the figure be used cautiously because the number of factors that are considered as due to a potential cost of having this strategy. We again assessed the distributional effects in terms of spatial, temporal, and, 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 and uh, distributional effects among the user groups. So if for the spatial distribution, that is the extent, then we, we, we found out that conservation management strategy will enhance ecosystem services of the globally important ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration and also the globally endangered species that are found within the wetland. Agricultural intensification will benefit the region because based on the interviews, rice farming is likely to be conducted in Uganda and fish farming is likely to be conducted in Kenya. And these are likely to be sold within at the national level or even regionally. Temporal distribution of the effects. Conservation will have ecosystem services in perpetuity because management within the generation led will be will be supervised. But for the status quo, best business of visual scenario, based on the current trend of degrad of, uh, of degradation of the wetland and the drivers of change. And then we see that by 2041, 41, a number of ecosystem services, large regulating services will be non-existent. The, what we normally call the provisioning services that en involve uh, direct uses of land, carrier services, the ones remaining. And so is the actual intensification. We assumed that if we adopt that, then by the next five years, the entire wetland will be under, agri under rice farming or fish farming. And that means that all those other ecosystem services will be either non-existent or be there in minimal, in minimal amount. So basically in terms of temporal distribution within five years, we will see loss of a number of ecosystem services from, from, from the wetland. And uh, just, this is the last slide, uh, Mr. Lula, just let me present this. So, our okay. then recommended actionable recommendations are one, we find that there are a number of inefficient benefits that people derive from the wetland. This end up lowering their productivity. And therefore, an intervention that will see uh, demoting or adding value to these ecosystem services like domestic water supply from the wetland 
or growing of maize and beans being substituted with, with others, or brick making being downgraded or demoted, and mat making requiring some mobile addition if it has to be promoted or being demoted is, is a better way of, of uh, supporting the local community. Two, status quo will lead to the loss of most of the same services. Therefore, we recommend a new strategy of managing the rental and other status quo. We also saw that investment in the proposed construction management plan will provide the best value for money and, 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 and as compared to all those others. And of course, it has the best returns more than the BAU. So we recommend that it be considered on, on those two fronts. It has the best returns more than the BAU. It has the best value for money compared to agricultural densification. So thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Philip, for that uh, presentation on COC Teco. Uh, that presentation shares some of the values. So COC Teco is not just a wasteland, but uh, it's a wetland. It's a resource with, uh, with benefits to people and uh, the associated economy. So thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, questions uh, we will follow during uh, the panel uh, discussion. Uh, now I take uh, this chance to welcome Monica Lopez, who is from UNEP, to give us uh, her presentation. Welcome, Monica. Thanks very much, Leonard. And thank you, Philip, for stepping in. I am really sorry that we had this um, high-tech mishap. I think during these times we have to be flexible. So it's an honor for me to be part of this development forum with the Nail Basin Initiative. And it's been an honor for me to be part of it from the, from the beginning. I remember the first stakeholder consultation workshop when the areas were being decided. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here at this point when I'm seeing that we've reached the, the last of the steps in terms of sharing all the information. Um, next slide, please. So I will speak on behalf of TEEB. As you can see, TEEB is now um, secretariat by the Environment Program UNEP, but it's funded by the European Union and also by the International Climate Initiative. Next one, please. So I will just step back a few minutes because I know everybody has worked a lot on TEEB and I've seen that all of you have followed the, the steps, but just to go to the origins of TEEB. We follow from that, please. So as you may know, it started in 2008. It was a response to, to one of the biodiversity COPs in which we were trying to figure out what the value of biodiversity loss would be. Um, following on from that, TEEB has decided to do reports that are always more targeted and more oriented towards the stakeholders that would be reading them. So from them, there has been like a, a spin-off, we could say, uh, linked to the private sector. There's also been one for local um, stakeholders. And, and also another spin-off is the TEEP for Agriculture and Food, which I will speak about in a, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. One of the most important things I think that um, TEEP came up with also as part of, the, of a consultation process was the six step approach. Basically, the, the first step is to decide what is the demand, what do, the governments want to hear about. And then the last step would be to actually inform that demand. But all the way in between is probably a lot of the work that our colleagues have been doing in, in these transboundary and national research that we will hear about today, which is which are those relevant ecosystem services? How are we going to value them? What are the needs for them? And also develop the scenarios and make sure that those scenarios are going to be helpful for the people who are who we are aiming them at, whether it's a management plan, for example, I think we will we will see later on. So make sure that the, the trade-offs and the policy options that we show in the scenario um, are backed up by the economic evidence and the environmental evidence of what the best option would be. Next slide, please. So I would just like to share some deep country studies linked to watershed and water management. Next one. Although I really admire, for example, the work on the Nile Basin Initiative because it wasn't um, determined by the donor, for example, preferring one country or another, it was determined by the Nile Basin Initiative itself deciding what was most important. I think I'll just share, for example, the case of Bhutan in which there was a demand for a hydropower development. So that was a reality in the country. There needed to be hydropower development. Now, in terms of the watershed, which one would be the most 
the one that would cause a less impact or the one that would maintain the provision of the ecosystem services in the longer term. So the ecosystem services that we evaluated were provision of fresh water, quantity and quality, few, food, fuel and wood. I thought this was interesting because I see that a lot of the, um, of the water areas that you are that you're working on as an air basin initiative also captures that. And of course, habitat for species from the biodiversity point of view. Um, next one. The other two that I wanted to share is the one in the Philippines and the one in Liberia. So in the case of the Philippines, there was going to be uh, some infrastructure built and it was going to have an impact on a protected area. So they reached out to TEEP for them to better understand whether it was going to comply with the environmental process and what impacts that was going to have on the biodiversity and the provision of the ecosystem services of the area. In the case of Liberia, we also had some wetland areas and it was mainly a study on the impact of the coastal mangroves. And the ecosystem services that were evaluated there were also food provision, regulation of extreme events, because it was mangrove areas in the coastal and cultural values, which I also appreciate hearing that from, from a lot of the Nile Basin Initiative studies. So next one, please. So maybe I'll just dash off now into what Tibagri Food, how we started it and, and why it came about. Next one, please. So the main reason is why did we decide to work with the agriculture sector? So if you see here, the, um, the ones like the, the sectors that have the biggest link to between environment and the biggest cost for the natural capital are those that are linked to agriculture. Plus, agriculture provides most of, more than one third of the employment in the world. It provides enough calories for everybody, although the distribution, as you know, is, is not always equity or equitable. And, and also there are possible potentials for agriculture to have positive impacts on, on the environment, whether it's climate change or biodiversity, or even in terms of ecosystem services like soil retention. So we decided to focus on the agriculture sector. Please, next one. So uh, as I explained, basically what we would like to do is to make sure that we do an, a comprehensive economic valuation of the eco agri food systems. So we're not just going to focus on the environment or only going to focus on the agriculture, but across the value chain. And we want to make sure that currently the, um, the environment in which farmers are working on has externalities. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive, but it, it impacts the way that they work and hence it impacts on the provision of the ecosystem services. There's also not always a very strong awareness in terms of how dependent the natural capital is on the social capital and vice versa. So next one, please. I will, this is just an article that came out when we first developed the, um, the agri-food. Currently, a lot of the, of the food systems focus on, on one indicator and that is um, productivity per hectare. However, we would like to increase that lens and focus on many others. We would like to make sure we understand the links to the social, the human and the environmental impacts of, of food systems. Next one, please. So actually in the next, all the next slides are going to go, if you don't mind very fast from, because it's like a, a, flowing, a flowing diagram. So basically we have the agriculture and food system here and we want to go through the whole um, value chain. So from the seeds to the production, to the transport, to the, um, to the consumption. Next one. And here we, all, we want to see the links between the human system and the natural system. Next one. And we see that there are visible flows from the human system to the agriculture. For example, irrigation, fertilizers, machinery, all those are things that we can actually include in our system of national accounts. And there is a price for them. There is, a, there is an amount that we will include into our accounts. Next one, please. However, there are also some invisible flows, for example, from the biodiversity into the agriculture. So thanks to pollinators, for example, or, or thanks to climate regulator or freshwater provisioning, our agriculture and food systems can actually thrive. There are also some visible flows going from agriculture to human systems like um, food. I think that's the, the main one that we're all worried about, but also employment, for example, in fibers. Next one. 
But then there are also invisible systems that go from agriculture and food to biodiversity ecosystems. And that's what we call the externalities that we don't always measure, but we must keep in mind if we're going to make good decisions in terms of the future. So like the pollution or the loss of ecosystems, the species reduction and the impact on the climate. And I believe some of the studies that, we've, that we will listen to have been able to get the value of, of these services. Next one, please. And here we also have some positive flows from agriculture to human systems. So, well, health can be positive or negative, but the importance of the cultural aspects and the access to recreation. Next. So all this, I just wanted to share with you how we've come up with the, with the framework, the impacts on human, social and produced capital across the value chain from the agricultural production all the way to household consumption, but also waste. Next, please. And this is just a, a quick overview of the different places where we are now carrying out the tea bag food studies. So a lot of these are just starting, but I believe we have a lot to learn from how you have done the Nile Basin Initiative studies, because I think you've all followed a participatory approach in terms of defining the the values of the ecosystem services, but also the scenarios, which is really appreciated because then I hope that's the one that's going to be able to feed into the policy demands and needs. And I think the next one is would be the last one, but basically to say that, yeah, I, I look forward for us to collaborating more and, and hopefully I'm available for any questions you may have or any future linkages we could continue fostering in this initiative. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Monica, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, normally, we don't uh, recognize the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services into the food that we consume on our tables. The so-called visible and invisible hand in agricultural production. And actually, your presentation has uh, highlighted that. Uh, for instance, the pollination services. We hardly, we hardly see it or we hardly recognize uh, those services. And that is very great to map those services and to make them matter. Thank you. Uh, please post your questions uh, under the Q&A. If you don't have any, if you, if you don't, if the Q&A is not active in your case, please then post your question under the chat. We will try as much as possible to answer those questions during the discussion or we'll answer directly from our resource person. So please post the question. And if you're joining us now, kindly introduce yourselves under the chat, state your name, your organization, and your country. Thank you so much. I will now take this opportunity to invite uh, the third presentation, which will come from uh, Telly. And Telly is going to share with us Semliki Delta team study. Semliki Delta is shared between Uganda and DRC. Welcome, uh, Telly. And kindly open your camera and uh, share your production presentation and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Leonard. Uh, I hope to will do it. Can you see the presentation? Right. Just a minute, let me see. I'm trying to share. Yeah, the green, there is the green thing saying share screen. Just click that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can see it coming. Okay, is it there? Yeah, it's loading. Okay. Can you all now see it? We are seeing a blank screen. Oh. Can you click? Click on it. Yeah, can you click as if you are going to the next slide? Okay. Uh, has it moved? No, it's not moving. In screen share, click on the PowerPoint presentation. When you're in screen share, you will see all the apps which are running on your desktop. Then click on the PowerPoint. 
Prepare the one you want to present. Click on the one you want to present. I'm in the Zoom. You can click the green arrow, share screen. I think you have not selected the presentation. When you have said share, you have to select the right presentation. Let's click share and go to and uh, open for and open the presentation also. And share the whole screen instead of uh, sharing only your uh, uh, PPT. Okay. The presentation is there. Maybe you left me from that side. Oh, okay. Uh, because I'm trying everything, I, I can see the presentation here. Okay, tell me. I've clicked on share. Yes. My screen okay, tell me. Yes, please. Tell me, let's have, uh, tell me, let's have Professor Haman uh, do his presentation as we sort yours. Professor Haman. Okay, thank please. you. Take, take the floor. Professor Harman. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Let me see if. Uh... So let me, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if it will, it, I'll be, <laughs> mine will be okay. Share screen, okay. Yes. And then, um, Open your camera. The camera. You don't want us to see you. <laughs> ah, you want uh, to see me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's long time. Do you see me? Yes, then share, share your screen. Share the screen. Now, where is the thing? Share sound. Just down on your computer, there's a green thing, share screen. Ah, share, share. And then I go yes. to, to the oh, PPT. Yes, yes. Select it. Let us see if okay. it... Yeah, I think uh, there is this joke about us that we were BBC, born before computers. Okay, no problem. And then full view for the, yes, good. And then, then okay. Your uh, thank you so much. Th thank you. Kindly thank you. hold on. Kindly, uh, the remaining presenters, kindly, uh, kindly ensure your presentations are set so that you can share it immediately. Your call upon Professor Haman, proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonard and colleagues. And uh, I think, uh, as already mentioned, as uh, indicated. Uh, my study was on Weru, Bugesera, transboundary wetlands complex. And uh, the outline is as given. It, this was a case study. We have objectives, methodology, legal policy and strategic framework, stakeholders, analysis, ecosystem services, the evaluation, the issue of uh, degradation, and then uh, the scenarios, development options and conclusions. I think even a time, I, I will not spend a lot of time on each. Uh, I think uh, we shall uh, concentrate on the major issues that are of interest to this forum and to colleagues who are present. As mentioned, these are wetland, com it's a wetland complex, wetlands complex straddling Rwanda and Burundi. And um, I should maybe, for those who are a little bit familiar with the area, I should like to make it clear that it is not Rweru Mugesera. Rweru Mugesera is one of the sub-basins based in Rwanda, but Rweru Mugesera involves the Lake Rweru, Lake Johoa, and also um, 
uh, the, we can call it the geographical zone called Bugesera in both Burundi and Rwanda. And uh, it's not, uh, uh, we can say it's not the, the, the largest of the wetlands in the Nile Basin, but it's important because it's transboundary between the two countries. And as I said, it uh, straddles Burundi and Rwanda for the administrative districts of Gesera in Rwanda and that of Kirundo, which is a province. So here we have both aquatic and marshlands, that is you have the lakes, Lake Kyohoha and the Lake Rueru, which is shared by both countries. And also you have uh, the Akagera. Uh, so you, you, you talk of, uh, we say na naturally the two areas, the areas on both sides of the border, a shared border uh, of uh, the same uh, agroclimatic uh, co uh, characteristic. And I mean, actually, even uh, originally, Bugesera means uh, an area that uh, is like savanna. Now, I think this is important to mention that the, the Rwanda and Burundi are part of the Nile Basin, and therefore, you can say. Uh, these uh, wetlands that uh, uh, around the source of the Nile, uh, the source of the Nile River, and I, I'm not uh, about to say uh, which is the exact uh, source, but uh, I think uh, the, the the river. I mean, for example, for Rwanda and Burundi, this most of the rivers uh, draining in the River Nile, and you find that from Lake Rueru actually. This is um, uh, the reservoir that uh, feeds water uh, towards the Akagera and in the Lake Victoria, uh, and then later to 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 uh, the Nile River. Uh, objectives, I think, uh, this almost common about uh, the investigating beneficiaries of case study wetland generated economic benefits to determine the current value of case study wetland biodiversity and economic ecosystem services, and then see economic impact of the case study wetland degradation and loss. And then I think uh, in terms of uh, options, I get insights about uh, investing in those areas. Now, maybe I should mention for uh, austerity that uh, for some time I was indisposed, so I, I joined later, I mean, in the project. And as a result, when I did uh, the really work on this, the COVID-19 pandemic had come in. So I had to be very much depend on um, secondary data, especially benefit transfer, areas, some travel costs that are, are, are unknown market prices from secondary data available and uh, data sources in, in both countries. So I always have this feeling that should, if there was no pandemic, and I'm sure it is uh, some of the uh, countries around also are still under the, the problem of the pandemic, but I think uh, it would be possible to have a more uh, nuanced or a more precise collection data collection uh, of um, ecosystem services and uh, other information. But we have a reach of data services. You can remember that we have uh, the NELSAP uh, based in Kigari for, for the area. Then you also have these other projects like the Kagera Basin. You have the TIB databases mentioned about. You have a number of studies that are maybe specifically on one part of the border, some areas, and these have uh, quite adequate, I cannot say sufficient information for which uh, some of the general findings we have are based. Now, um, the first thing which, which I think was very uh, interesting to note is that there is a battery, there is a very, a long list of, of strategies, policies, visions in both countries, Burundi and Rwanda. 
And the first question was myself, was I asked myself, why? What is the problem? Why, why are we interested in this? Because we find, we find, we talk about degradation, we talk about uh, maybe need to know what is uh, the wise use because of uh, maybe uh, unsustainable use of wetlands. And then I found that if it was for uh, the legal and the regulatory framework, they are there, most of them are, well, robust to almost every aspect to wish to know about conservation, protection, and even management. So the culprit is somewhere either in enforcement or some gaps at a lower level. And uh, I also, I think, make uh, an assertion that perhaps those uh, uh, statutes or instruments that are transboundary may, may, may not be there, or maybe the, the powers, the convening powers, the, the, the power of influence of uh, transponder bodies have not reached a point where the enforcement of uh, laws and the regulations can make sure there is a, a sustainable uh, use, or let us say, when we talk to the scenarios, a uh, prospect of uh, using the wetlands for the benefits of the two countries and the Nile Basin or Riparians in general. Now, another issue that you find, and I think this is uh, important to note, maybe although it is general here, you have a multitude, you have a very long list of stakeholders. Some are direct, some are indirect, some are state, some are non-state, some are primary, others are secondary. You have those who look into the future, some uh, the time preference is present. You have national, regional, and global, international. And these have different interests and different influences. And I think needless to mention, that's where the issue of trade-offs comes in, that you have uh, interests on, and, and, and influences and, and expectations from uh, multiple stakeholders. Of course, here, I think, uh, uh, the distinction, or not the distinction, the question is among these who is beneficiary and who is not beneficiary. If you are talking about a conservation, someone who is interested in the conservation of wetlands, maybe someone who is with Ramsar or someone with the Nile Basin, uh, do, you, do you call him or her a beneficiary or are you talking about the farmers and livestock keepers uh, in, the, in the wetland complex of the two countries? But I think in a way do you find some sort of, uh, well, strictly when you talk of benefits, we are beneficiaries, we are thinking of those people, maybe agricultural uh, use or private sector investors. But I think uh, when you have interest and influence, you're also expecting a certain benefit, even if it is a public good or maybe for, 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 for the, whole, the whole, the globe, the planet, because I think uh, sustainability is now a public good and also a global good. So here uh, you, you can see uh, different types of users and, and uh, what they do, direct extensive users, direct intensive users, direct exploiters, agricultural producers, water users, indirect users, human settlement, nature conservation. And I mean, even if it is relatively small compared to other wetlands, you can see that uh, the number of uh, people who may use the wetlands is uh, uh, not uh, uh, very, very small. And as I said, if uh, under conditions of uh, field work, it would be very good to get deeper information about this. This I have mentioned about uh, different uh, stakeholders uh, from the different countries, whether they are global, although it is, uh, let us say, uh, stakeholders who are primarily, secondary, or international, I mean, with inter interest and influence. So th this is just uh, maybe to emphasize that we have uh, players, actors, many actors with different expectations and uh, expecting different benefits. It's not, uh, as a teacher, I don't assume that everybody uh, remembers about provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services, and supporting services. 
uh, using the Millennium Assessment uh, uh, approach. Uh, the photos there are just the visuals, like how people, I, I took these uh, on the Rwanda side when it was possible to travel, but I could not interview, like the reads, uh, head of the stories of the maths and, and so on and so forth. There, there are many, but this is one example that you see here. I, I, it is not very visible, but this is a place where you have uh, the Ruelu Lake and the, the marshlands, which are said to be reservoirs of many other uh, aquatic bodies in Rwanda, where you have uh, several lakes that are depending on, 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 on these wetlands. And, and most of these are also within the Nile Basin uh, uh, drainage area. So it's very important. You have uh, this issue of um, uh, fish and, and boating, of course, in the report of the study, we even talk about possible water sports and so on and so forth. You have fish, fish. Uh, uh, there are very interesting stories about uh, degradation. You can see they are small, but that they think some uh, very predatory uh, species was introduced there and started eating the rest of them. And, and even now, I think there is some sort of conflict between uh, fishermen on both sides uh, of the border uh, because of uh, fishing, looking for uh, scarce fish uh, that has been uh, diminished by a very predatory uh, invasive species. But another story that would be interesting for the wetlands is the story of the water hyacinth, which is normally regarded as not so good news to the Nile River, and but which uh, there have been interest in looking at how the water hyacinth can be used. It's deadly weed, but can be used for either uh, economic purposes. We have women cooperatives using these for handicrafts and so on and so forth. And uh, there were some trials to see if they can produce some fertilizer, but I haven't followed enough uh, to see whether there are any really tangible, sustainable ways of uh, attacking the dead weeds. But I think this is one of those uh, issues that really link uh, the, the, this area to the rest of the Nile Basin, because I think these travel to Lake Victoria and it may be a problem. I think the eutrophication problem in Lake Victoria and even interruption with the, the discharge of water from Lake Ruel may be an issue that is beyond the, 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 the transboundary wetlands, the two countries only. Because I think it's important to see how, how this links to the rest of the Nile Basin. Yeah, okay, there is the issue of degradation. The water in Akanyaru, which is the third sub basin, being very brown because of erosion, you can see on uh, steep sides of, uh, I mean, both Rwanda and Burundi have many hills that are steep and more than even 50 degrees, and a lot of fresh topsoil is washed in the into the river, and and I think. Uh, uh, whether you could say this is advantage or disadvantage, I think this is another very interesting thing you can find in this area. There are potentialities of uh, tourism, uh, bed watching. I think uh, in that area, of course, we, there are other types of tourism activities that are prominent in Rwanda and Burundi, but this has not been exploited uh, with regard to the area. Now, maybe the most important thing uh, here, I just summarized in one slide, I was looking at uh, estimates of uh, 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 total economic uh, values. And here we have uh, provisioning 92 million, degrading 25, cultural 1.8, and supportive 14, all are about uh, 124 million. I have a hunch that Perhaps if uh, we uh, more professional surveys are done, I guess I have this feeling that uh, the regulating services may be a little bit more than the current estimate. But I think the point being made here is that, and I think, uh, I hope um, uh, uh, 
with due respect that perhaps the, the issue of uh, the values of these wetland complexes, um, not only to the people, but things that are maybe not in the national accounts of these countries properly, uh, is a point. And maybe more, I recommend that more thorough uh, estimation can be done, of course, with the, uh, maybe a accommodation of what would be uh, the net, or let us say the those that are not for sustainable uh, production or use. And then there is also, despite this uh, imperative of uh, valuable wetlands, we have all sorts of uh, degradation. Prof, one minute. One minute? Prof, yep. yes, please. Okay, I'll move quickly and uh, finish. So uh, here we have also threats agriculture, pollution, pit mining, sand and clay mining, invasive species, bushfire, infrastructure, etc. And then we estimated, I estimate, we estimated that at least the current levels of degradation would be up to 27.6 million US dollars, something about almost like 1.6% of the GDP of the two countries. Don't forget that these are not big countries, big economies. Uh, so, but it is substantial, it is not suboptimal. Now, looking ahead in the horizon of 25, 30 years, we have the business as usual, worst case scenario, and the best case scenario. The business scenario I call linear because I, at least we, there is some amount of uh, now with the exposure and the, 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 the emphasis on environment, sustainability, SDGs. So in a way that things would continue as they are, uh, but I think uh, it's not the same as worst case scenario if, for example, there was a covert and pervasive uh, degradation. And the best case, best case scenario would be when something is done, something deliberately done to ensure that uh, the degradation that is taking place, or let us say the use of the wetlands are such that there would be wise use. And uh, to make it easy, because the wetlands complex was through analysis involving so many, many things, water resources, agriculture, livestock, fishing, energy, and then regulation up to 25. So if you group them, we identified four pillars, the wise use of lakes, marshes, and the, and the, the river, the protection, restoration, and conservation strategies, and the, the promotion of green water infrastructure development and the, the governance and enabling drivers to sustainable development. The issue here is uh, departing from the, the, the business as usual to business as unusual and, and uh, take steps maybe uh, not perhaps in a holistic, in a global for all of them, but uh, in, uh, because of resources in a manner that is forward looking and uh, in a manner, I think there is a study that was done, which I depended on very much for basic data for wise use and uh, sustainable use of the wetlands. We have a series of conclusions here, southernmost wetlands complex studying the two countries. You have disjoint studies, uh, you have some in Akagera, some in Burundi, some in Rwanda. You have multiple stakeholders and multiple interest. We have limited site specific knowledge on ecosystems and biodiversity. These are just uh, uh, very general estimates I gave. I think they would need to have more uh, accurate and more, uh, more detailed studies. Wide ranging policies I mentioned about, yet you have enforcing is very weak. And uh, you find, yeah, yeah, the, the enforcement is maybe up to 30, 35. Uh, these are the values I mentioned. And um, uh, the pillars I have mentioned, the four pillars. And I think uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. Time is not on my side. And I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, over thank to you, you, Leonard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for bringing uh, Rueru Bugesera on the Nile Basin uh, map with regards to its ecosystem services and, uh, uh, and ecosystem services and goods. The value of that, which is very important 
uh, when you're talking of any development, transboundary, national, or whatever. So thank you very much for bringing this information forward. Uh, of course, questions uh, will follow during the discussion. So just uh, relax uh, and then come up with a question. Now I move to the next presentation by Kelly. Chris Daly, uh, kindly present in the next 10 minutes or less. And then please, if you have a question, please keep posting them. I see many questions coming in. Keep posting them under Q&E or under the chat. Just post your question there and we will answer them. Tell me, the floor or the air is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Kindly share for, my, for me. Can you share the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. It Can is oh. Yeah, it will be shared in, in a second. Jim, do you see the screen? Yes, I see the screen, but I... Yes, we are seeing the screen. And, uh, you have clicked the presentation, so I think it should be loading. Why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long? Just, Just a minute. Two seconds. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much. As it uh, has been communicated already, uh, Eugene Muramira and I worked on the Semliki Delta. Uh, Semliki Delta is between uh, the Republic of Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, just below Lake Albert. And uh, it's uh, basically the confluence of, uh, of the Delta of uh, the River Semliki entering Lake Albert uh, and flowing down from the Ruenzoris. Um, if you go to the next screen, the next, uh, next slide. Yeah, the study was basically uh, commissioned by the Nile Basin Initiative under the Global uh, uh, TIB program. Uh, TIB has been explained very well by Lopez in the earlier presentation. And uh, this study is in the framework real of uh, understanding the baseline situation in the uh, ecosystem and determining uh, the level of necessary investment to uh, reverse the current degradation that is going on there. The delineated uh, study area is about 500 square kilometers in that place that I just uh, tried to, de to de describe, uh, uh, comprising mostly of the Semliki Flats in the, the Ugandan side in three sub-counties of Sengo, Buramule, and the Kanara. And then uh, in a different system in the DRC, they call groupings, including about six groupings uh, in the Ituri province of the DRC, this is Nachuchu, Kaliabugongo, Buguma, Rubungura, Kikoga, and Nyanzike, uh, totaling about 500 square kilometers in terms of uh, moving along the river, about 60 kilometers really, and then uh, uh, that amount of width. If you go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Uh, my approach was basically to look at the current situation in terms of the ecosystem values. 
Uh, and we looked at a number of ecosystem values coming out of this particular delta, looked at fisheries, handcrafts, fuel wood, ship, boat rearing, uh, carbon sequestration, extraction of water reeds, uh, various medicinal plants, uh, milk values from the cattle that are reared in there, and then it's water supply, uh, use of such material, and that uh, in the baseline year of 2019, came to a total value of about 90 billion Uganda shillings. I've been asked why I use the Uganda shillings rather than dollar. I'm trying to avoid the distortion of exchange rates, especially that we will project into the future for about 20 years. And uh, of course, you know, the dynamism in the, uh, um, in the financial markets could cause problems for me in terms of tracking the exchange rate. So I keep my figures in Uganda shillings to eliminate that challenge. But uh, currently the exchange rate is about 3,650 Uganda shillings per dollar. So in terms of real understanding the situation, you can divide the figures I will give by that figure to get the dollar equivalent in the current exchange uh, rate prices. So uh, the approach I used is a production function approach. You will look at the theoretical framework that I provide shortly. And the argument is that uh, uh, in terms of uh, supporting household welfare or household supplies of different ecosystem services, uh, that is goods and services, the wetland generates some contribution and then people's labor and the different other inputs generate a particular uh, production output for, for the households. So imputation of the value of the wetland is a, uh, a calculation of a little bit of that total value of uh, the output. And uh, that is my theoretical framework. So in 2019, when we added the total picture, the uh, contribution of wetlands to the households in that 500 square kilometer area was about 90 billion. The overall picture, if you look, go to the next slide, oh, I think you shared the wrong slide there is a different slide that i sent to you that is advised it has a lot more information sorry about this mess up uh, anyway the general picture if you can be looking for that as we go on the general picture is that uh, there is a lot of degradation going on in the ecosystem with the the values along the 20 year period of projection decreasing rapidly uh, if you look at the structure of the, the bar charts, are you trying to get to the other presentation? It will take a few minutes, but we're going to find it eventually and upload it. Okay. Yes, meanwhile, I can just uh, speak then uh, as you load it. The degradation that goes on over the years keeps reducing, as you see those declining uh, height of the budget, uh, reducing the value of output per year. And uh, the cost of degradation, therefore, is that value that is lost, which is, in other words, if you take a baseline parallel line, the area under that parallel line and above the curve that is generated by those budgets is the equivalent of the total uh, cost of uh, degradation of the wetland. And uh, depending on uh, the situation that you, you look at in terms of the scenario building, we looked at two possibilities. Is a, a business as usual scenario where we allow the conditions of degradation to continue. Have you got to the... You got the, the, the new presentation? Yes, it's on screen. Tell us the slide to go to. Okay, you can go to slide. Uh, the slide with the, the pie chart. If you flip through, just after the theoretical framework, there is a slide with the pie chart. Yeah, the next slide. Yes, okay. In terms of the distribution of the 
uh, economic output of the wetlands for the year 2019. You see that distribution there. So the 90 billion shilling contribution is mostly accounted for by dry season grazing, uh, the, the cattle, the goats that are grazing in there. And uh, then when they are sold, generate about 47% of the total of the 90 billion Uganda shillings to households, and then fisheries resources. There's a lot of fishing, uh, about three major uh, species there, mostly the mud fish, uh, uh, fishes there, and a little bit of, of tilapia. Um, so that, that's the picture in 2019. But uh, if you go now to the next screen, the next, uh, the next slide, The next slide, please. Okay, you see, as I have explained, a reduction in the output, and when you compute over 20 years, the total cost of the degradation is uh, 569 billion, uh, 0.87 something Uganda shillings, uh, in the total figures, Annualized over the 20 years, uh, but when you discount that against a 12% uh, discount rate uh, over the 20 years, the discounted total value is 150 billion. And uh, in terms really of justifying an investment requirement to, uh, to, to, to reverse that loss, economic loss that is going on there, uh, these figures in terms of total and discounted give us a picture of roughly how much we do need to be investing in a, uh, different wetland management, different alternative livelihood uh, strategies in a, this particular wetland uh, so that uh, we uh, stem the economic losses that are going on there. Uh, in the view of the amount of time that was uh, talked about of 10 minutes, I didn't want to go into a lot of details into how the study was done, you know, uh, the challenges that we met and so on. But those are basically the quick figures that I can give and the broad picture of continued degradation and a huge justification from these figures you see uh, for uh, uh, investment in the uh, wetland management. Uh, apparently, this study was supposed to be in putting into a process of developing wetland management plan, uh, and it gives here. Uh, a, a kind of scope of how much money we'll be talking about in terms of really recovering the amount of loss that we are incurring. So, Leonard, uh, thank you for the technical intervention and the sorry, ladies and gentlemen, for the technical mess up that happened. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you, uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you, Telly, for this uh, presentation, uh, bringing in uh, these ecosystems values from uh, Uganda and the DRC, and also knowing the challenges that uh, such kind of study working from DRC uh, on this side of Uganda. So thank you so much for sharing your results. I will now move to the next uh, uh, presentation, and I kindly ask uh, the next presenter uh, to take 10 minutes or less so that we have enough time. There are a lot of questions that are being asked that I think we should discuss. So I will call upon the next uh, presenter, who is uh, Dawit, Dr. Dawit uh, Wobushet of Bashar. Please, Dawit, uh, kindly make your presentation. Okay, David, you can start. You have uh, less than yes. 10 minutes. Yes. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. If you can hear just the highlights of your work, please. Mashar wetlands in South Sudan with connection to Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia area, Gambela. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Leonard. Uh, this study is a part of the the Nile Tip Initiative, which is the three presenters were presenting uh, before me. Uh, so uh, there are many studies that has been done with this region. Around 200 published documents are there, but 
but still uh, studies are limited in the South Sudan wetlands, except there are a few studies uh, specifically that has been done by Mohammed and others, uh, focusing on the economic valuation of wetland uh, ecosystem service. Particularly studies are limited in much our marsh wetland. Please so, put in presentation mode. Sorry? Put in presentation mode, slide mode. Slide how about now? Mode. Yes, how about oh, now? Good. Great. Good. Yeah, so the key objective of this uh, report is more on the economic valuation and biodiversity of the ecosystem service in the Machar area, uh, more on to, to investigate the economic, social, and cultural benefits and uh, to estimate uh, the value of Machar Marsh wetland ecosystem services and also the impact uh, of the wetland degradation and then to give uh, some sort of policy recommendation for a integrated development of decision making on the on the wetland management. So our methodology is more on primary and secondary sources. Uh, we use uh, data from South Sudan National Statistic Office. We got uh, from the intro, the Eastern Nile uh, Technical Regional Office uh, regarding the Baro Akobo Sobat River. Uh, water and sediment retention and uh, water flow information. And also we use the European Space Agency and the US Global uh, Geological Survey uh, land sat imageries uh, for conducting the ecosystem service account or the land use land cover analysis. And we use a benefit transfer and market price approach in, in estimation of the, the economic values. And, uh, and also for that purpose, we use published and unpublished reports. The global TIB and the Nile TIB report database was used. So, uh, and also we conduct a key informant interview, a focus group discussion, document review. And also we had a consecutive uh, technical team review meeting and consultations. Uh, so these are the whole process regarding the methodology. So regarding the results, uh, we are trying to, uh, to identify the role, interest, and the influence and power of stakeholders in the Machar areas. So I think if you saw, if you can see from the picture, um, researcher has less interest and less influence because of the accessibility of the region, but uh, they have uh, high interest and high influence from the local community and also the national and local government have uh, a higher influence in the process. So. Uh, and also we are trying to map the ecosystem service account with the ecosystem service. Uh, that means that what are the services that we get from the, from the different land use land cover. And we are trying to map these things. And uh, we are trying also to list which ecosystem is the interest of the, the local community and the NGOs and the national government and the researchers. So, we are trying to map the stakeholder interest in terms of the service that they get uh, or that they give priority. So if you saw uh, the government and the researchers have similar interest in the ecosystem service and the local community and the non-government organizations are listing uh, and similar uh, ecosystem services. So regarding the impact, uh, Local communities are more concerned about resource depletion, over exploitation of some of the resources, deforestation, wildfires and lack of awareness is the main uh, challenge or the main reason for the wetland degradation. Especially the upstream development activities of some canal the building and the, the Ethiopian government development plans, uh, those are their concern. Uh, from the global community, climate change issues, and from the South Sudan government, oil extraction and lack of enforcement mechanism to implement institutional capacity is uh, their concern regarding the wetland degradation. So having said that, we are trying to list the different ecosystem service based on the Millennium Ecosystem Service Assessment Report. So you can see uh, these lists of provisioning services are provided by the wetland. So uh, one of the, the 
crop farming activities we took the who are the communities how many number of households and then how many areas of cropland in the area so uh, we estimated based on, based on the 2015 uh, as a base year uh, when you are trying to to estimate the ecosystem service value but note that this is not a flow value this is a stock value the capacity of the wetland so you can see the wetland has a capacity to provide about 100 $23 million per year of crop services. For livestock watering and pasturing, uh, we are trying to, uh, to find the livestock population, the pastoral communities, and also the watering practices and watering pointers. So you can see also about uh, half a million dollar per year for watering and also for around 27 million for pasturing. So regarding fishing, uh, about 8% of the population in the area are involved in the fishing practice and uh, fish resources are very rich in the area. So the fish stock value will be around $10 million. So papyrus and mud production is there and about 95% of the local communities are involved in uh, papyrus harvesting and about 5% also uh, they engage in mud and craft production or making. So that is also uh, used as a, a, as a raw material and direct use for mud production. You can see around $1.9 million uh, for raw papyrus use and also half a million for mud and craft production. So, and also it's used for wild food uh, sources and traditional medicine and bust meat. You will see that uh, how we estimate and then the values in terms of wild food, in terms of traditional medicine and bust feed. And honey production also, uh, they are estimated around uh, 400 beehives that produce uh, 3,500 kg of honey during the honey harvesting season uh, in the area. So it also supports the honey production. So fuelage, which is common, 98% uh, of the local community, their energy sources from uh, the firewood as a primary sources and uh, which, uh, which also contribute for the, uh, the woodland and the forest degradation, but it served for the community and uh, it has a value of around $24 million per year. Charcoal production also, around 2% of the population also involved in charcoal production for domestic energy, which is about $1.6 million. And domestic water, it's totally around 35% of the population use uh, the wetland water for drinking, laundry, cooking, bathing, and washing uh, utensils. And uh, sometimes also they do some irrigation practices, uh, which is, it has a significant uh, contribution for domestic water sources, which has its worth of uh, uh, around 156 or 50, uh, 57 million per year. So regarding the regulating ecosystem service, the, the wetland provides for carbon concentration, sediment retention, groundwater recharge, and also water purification and flood attenuation. Uh, so uh, you can see these are the values that we estimate using the benefit transfer approach, uh, considering uh, the standard uh, estimation mechanisms. It has a carbon sequestration capacity with the worth of $46 million per year, and also flood attenuation with the worth of $79 million. And also it contributes for sediment retention, which about 4.7 million, which, which is very high value. And the wetland also contribute for water purification and maintaining of the groundwater recharge. Uh, you can see from the map the potential of the area for recharging of the groundwater. Uh, this is a significant and very vital uh, regulating service that is the wetland provides uh, uh, regarding uh, these two ecosystem services. So, and also the wetland is rich in 400 different bird species and also 100 mammal species. And also it is re internationally recognized a wild haven for the uh, water falls birds. Uh, so we are trying to compare the, the, the capacity with the similar uh, wetland areas. So we 
if we estimate the biodiversity richness and the species diversity with the world of uh, 7.3 million dollar. So having said that, uh, the totally uh, the wetland has about 351 million dollar per year for provisioning service and also 262 million dollar for regulating and it has a total uh, uh, value of around 622 million per year, including the biodiversity ecosystem service. So uh, comparing this wetland ecosystem service economic value, it will be equal to around 4% or 4.2% of the South Sudan total GDP. Uh, we are trying to recalculate the GDP share, but this is a stock value. So. Our conclusion is uh, the key stakeholders that are influenced and impacted the wetland are local communities, government institution, research and academia, and non-governmental organization can play a significant role. Uh, there are slight trade-off in the land use land cover of the wetland. Uh, there is a decreasing trend in grassland cover, herbaceous cover, and uh, tree cover. There is an increasing trend in cropland, shrubland, and uh, some herbaceous cover flooded areas part of the wetland. So there is a, a need to work on the on the land the land use land use land cover management. So as we indicated, it has a total uh, economic value of around six hundred twenty two million dollar. Uh, so the wetland provisioning service, which is directly linked with the local community, has a higher monetary value as compared to the others. So uh, that shows uh, the local community has a high uh, impact with the services that they got from the wetland. So uh, as a policy implication, even though the wetland provides a significant economic value for the livelihood of the local community, but the wetland doesn't get protective authority for its sustainable provision. So, so far there is no institutional arrangement to manage the and ensure the sustainability of the wetland. But the South Sudanese government is trying to implement uh, with the Ministry of Environment, some activities for wetland uh, uh, conservation practices. So that should be supported. And some ecosystem services, uh, particularly related to the tree cover may be declined because of uh, degradation. So uh, some activity should be done on that uh, aspect. So considering the trend of land use land cover and the prospect of economic values of the wetland, we strongly recommend the following four uh, potential conservation options. Uh, we have to conserve the foothill part of the wetland. We have to conserve the floodplain areas of the wetland. And we have to do some intervention on the permanent wetland restoration. And also intervention is needed to maintain the water inflow uh, of the Machar wetland, because if the water drained there, uh, I don't think so, the wetland will be sustained there. But for each, uh, for uh, these uh, conservation options, uh, we also listed out different activities. So maybe you can, uh, we can share, you, you can find the report from the Nile Basin Initiative. So, but we recommend this for as, a, as an intervention areas. So, we would like to acknowledge those institutes who are supporting us in the process of developing this report. Uh, and I'm very thankful for the participant here uh, to hear our presentation in this regard. So that's all about Leonard and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, uh, David, for managing time well. And also thank you. It was not easy to bring uh, Mashar Mashes into the Nile Basin map in terms of evaluation of ecosystem services. So thank you for those many trips we made to South Sudan to gather this information so that you can come up with a credible study. Thank you Question very much. Come up. Uh, now I will invite uh, Dr. Jamal Tadese, who equally did uh, economic evaluation for Sud, equally a uh, very inaccessible uh, wetland. So Jamal, please uh, keep to less than 10 minutes so that we can have time to discuss. Our time is running. Jamal, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to share my slide. Go ahead, please. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. 
So put it on the presentation mode. Okay. And we want to see you, please. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try if it works. Okay. So now it's in a presentation mode, yeah? Yes, have it in presentation mode. Okay. Good. Okay, thank you, uh, Leonard and uh, colleagues. So my presentation uh, is uh, on the case of uh, Sudwetland uh, in South Sudan. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background and justification followed by methodology, then uh, results and uh, discussion, and then finally conclusions followed by uh, recommendation. And I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible uh, in the interest of time. So as we know, Sudi is one of uh, uh, Nile wetlands uh, and one of the, the, the biggest wetlands uh, in the world. And it's also uh, uh, recognized uh, as wetland of international importance uh, by the Ramsar uh, Convention or under the Ramsar Convention. And as Dawit mentioned, uh, there are a sizable study uh, on uh, ecosystem valuations of wetlands in the Nile Basin. However, uh, the study, uh, the, the spatial distribution of these wetlands uh, is not even, uh, especially uh, South Sudan is highly underrepresented in those studies. So uh, that's why Sud wetland is uh, selected uh, for this uh, study. And this is a main discussion for the study. Uh, when I come to the methodology, uh, we have depended both in primary and secondary uh, source of data. Uh, the primary sources, uh, we have conducted two consultative meetings, one in Kampala and uh, another in Juba. Uh, the Kampala consultative meeting was with the technical reviewers. And in that, uh, it helped us to, you know, uh, refine the objective of the study, you know, the methodology we have to use and uh, uh, the scenarios uh, for uh, the development option of the wetland have been uh, discussed in the Kampala meeting. In the Juba meeting, uh, it was more of a consultation with stakeholders, and uh, that has been very important to understand the wetland, the traits, uh, the ecosystem service provided by the wetland. So these are some of the primary sources we solicited from these two meetings. We have also, uh, uh, consulted secondary sources, mainly published and unpublished materials like policy documents uh, and different studies on uh, wetlands uh, uh, in South Sudan in particular and uh, the region uh, in general. And the method of analysis, uh, we applied uh, a, uh, a mix of market price approach and adjusted unit value, tra unit value transfer approach to uh, compute the economic value of the different ecosystem services from uh, the wetland. So these are the ecosystem services we considered uh, in our study. Uh, as you can see, we have provisioning, regulating biodiversity and cultural services. So these are some of agriculture uh, or crop production, uh, water for uh, domestic and livestock, uh, fishing, papyrus, grazing are some of the provisioning services, but the full list can be found in the report. Uh, with regard to cultural services, we consider only uh, transport because uh, the other cultural services uh, are in existence due to the situation, the local situation uh, in the country. Uh, when, it, when you see the regulated service, mainly we considered microclimate regulation, uh, water regulation, and uh, flood control services. And the wetland also provides biodiversity services because Within the wetland, there are uh, different uh, conserved areas. And uh, as a result, the wetlands serves as a wetland hub. I mean, a biodiversity hub. So uh, we try to also consider the biodiversity of the wetland. When we come to the results and discussion, uh, so the first thing we did was to uh, identify the stakeholders and uh, uh, to see uh, their roles and responsibilities. And as you can see, uh, the the, the, there are ministries, uh, then states, uh, districts, and communities-based organizations and communities. So basically, the ministries, normally, they 
formulate policies, regulations, they uh, formulate projects and uh, different interventions and they forward them to the states. Then the states uh, will customize those policies and then forward it to uh, the districts and the districts normally uh, mobilize the local communities and then feedback will go back from communities to the ministries to refine uh, the different policies and regulations. We have also institutions uh, at the peripheries like international development partners, uh, regional partners, NGOs, universities, and uh, research centers. So uh, these uh, institutions, you know, uh, play their own role in the conservation of the wetland in the, in the form of funding, uh, project designing and implementation, and at the same time, capacity building. These are some of uh, the roles of uh, the industries at the peripheries. And we try also to uh, extract the land use land cover map of the wetland. And uh, these are the different uh, land use of the wetland. And the total size of the wetland is uh, about 32,000 uh, kilometer square. And we use this one as a basis for our valuation. When you come to the total economic uh, uh, value of the wetland. So this table shows the provisioning services uh, from the wetland. And here we have a custom service size of, uh, in terms of hectare or population, we have the unit value or per capita value, uh, then the total value. And the last column shows the source of data and explanation. And as you can see, uh, livestock uh, grazing uh, stood uh, first among the cost, among the provision services provided by the wetland with a value of 190 million USD, uh, followed by uh, livestock watering and then uh, crop production uh, stood third in terms of uh, the, the, the provision services provided by uh, the wetland. And this is consistent with uh, what have been stated by the participants in the Juba meeting where uh, livestock grading and fishing are major activities within uh, the wetland. Here we have the, this table shows the cultural service and the cultural service stood at about uh, $140,000. Uh, then followed by the uh, regulating services. As we said, regulating services include microclimate regulation, flood control and water uh, regulation. And the highest value comes from the regulation service, which is about 1.8 billion USD. Then the last table shows the biodiversity uh, services. As I said, there are different uh, reserved areas and it serves as a biodiversity hub. And the total value for biodiversity services uh, stood at uh, about 1.2 uh, billion. And when we add the different uh, ecosystem uh, services, the total, uh, total economic value of the wetland stood at about 3.3 uh, billion uh, USD. And when we see the proportion of the different uh, ecosystem services from the wetland, uh, from the total economic value, 50%, 55% uh, is accounted by the regulating service, followed by 37% uh, for biodiverse services, and provisioning service uh, account is only for 8% of the uh, total economic value of uh, the wetland, where the cultural service is almost uh, non-existent compared to the other ecosystem services from the wetland. Uh, we also try to see development options uh, for the wetland, and we try to propose two options to the status quo situation. We propose the wild utilization uh, scenario for the wetland versus the status quo situation, and the green development path versus the status quo situation of the wetland and these scenarios were uh, prepared, I mean proposed in the Kampala meeting with the technical reviewers. Uh, normally, the economic valuation was undertaken considering the status quo situation. And as we have seen uh, the results for the total economic value, uh, most of the valuation, uh, uh, most of the value comes from uh, regulation and biodiversity. Uh, services. And as you can understand, uh, these services have a public good uh, character six, which means the benefits may not 
exhaustively uh, uh, totally accrue to the local communities that their benefit goes beyond uh, the, 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 the place where the wetland is located. So, so we try to see what uh, better options can be uh, think of about the situation uh, in, 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 in uh, or uh, about the situation in the, to the wetland. So we propose wise utilization and management. And in this case, the aim is to restore, rehabilitate, and conserve the, bi the biodiversity ecosystem services while ensuring sustainable livelihoods. So there are different uh, activities to, to be performed under the wise uh, utilization and management scenario for the wetland, like uh, land use planning, uh, land landscape restoration, rehabilitation, species and habitat conservation, uh, sustainable live, livestock production. Uh, these are some of the activities to be performed under uh, the wise uh, utilization and management uh, approach. We also try to see uh, the green development path uh, option for developing uh, the wetland. So this one basically uh, needs a balance between the economic uh, development aspiration of the country and uh, its ecosystem uh, conservation uh, in general and that of sur wetland uh, in particular. So under this scenario, uh, you know, building institutions, uh, capacity and conservation awareness and green infrastructure development uh, have to be uh, promoted and uh, implemented uh, instead of the status quo uh, situation. The conclusions, uh, so given its size, the wetland affects different stakeholders, local to global actors. And we, we particularly saw that local communities are both immediate beneficiaries as well as conservation actors of the wetland. So any development option has to be uh, focusing on uh, local communities uh, because as, as we said, they are both immediate beneficiaries and conservation actors. And the total economy of the wetland stood at about 3.3 uh, billion uh, USD. And most of the values come from regulating and biodiversity services. Uh, and this shows that unless uh, we think a different approach, the status quo may not be sustainable because we have seen that the provisioning services are low compared to the regulating and biodiversity services. Uh, okay. So the the wise use the wise use, uh, sorry. So the country has to balance between its development aspirations and its natural resource in general and that of uh, uh, Sud in particular. Uh, building institutions and their capacity as well as awareness creation and conservation practice are very uh, important. When we come to the recommendations, uh, we recommend strong institutions are very crucial uh, in efficiently conserving and managing the wetland. When we say uh, institution, it, it includes their capacity at the same time, budget, because uh, we have seen that uh, less or no budget is allocated for conservation issues in the country. So uh, if we think to bring a change, then we have to allocate sufficient budget for conservation issues. Uh, the government should also strive to solicit finance from uh, foreign sources. Uh, as we said, uh, some of the services are, uh, some of the services have a public good character, which means uh, external actors have also to play their part in the conservation of uh, the wetland. Uh, and we uh, say that the best approach to follow is the green development path, where we have to balance economic growth with resource in the endowment of the country. We also advise to promote uh, tourism using Sud wetland because we have seen that uh, Sud is considered as uh, a wetland of international importance. So it's also a biodiversity hub, so we can, you know, promote that one for uh, tourism. And finally, uh, okay. the polluter pay principle should be uh, applied. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jamal, for purposes of time. We will move to the next presentation by Ronald 
uh, trait lab. Ronald, please welcome. And Ronald will be sharing his presentation on financial mechanism to protect ecosystem services. Please welcome Ronald. Hello, everybody. So I hope there will be five minutes are left. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good day to, to the uh, participants and many thanks to the organizer and organizers to, to invite me to share our thoughts about um, nature and economics. Uh, I come from a different angle than uh, the speakers before me. Um, I start with um, the fact that nature mat matters and I explain why nature matters in economic terms. And after that, I'm presenting some basic thoughts about nature and economics before I describe the um, method technically, the method of intrinsic ecological value, which we invented. And then I show uh, some applications or how we, we apply the intrinsic ecological value. Um, the economics of land degradation has demonstrated that the rehabilitation of ecosystems is very costly. The DEEP initiative, on the other hand, shows the high values of the benefits of the ecosystems and their services. And despite these two facts, on the one hand, high costs for rehabilitation and high benefits of the uh, ecosystems and their services, land degradation is still one of the biggest uh, emission sectors. The benefits and the climate resilience of nature are obvious for me. Plants are extremely adaptive and they have demonstrated it for millions of years. For instance, ferns are found on each continent on, on the earth nowadays, which is an indication that uh, ferns already existed when the earth only had one landmass. The uh, dinosaurs came and got extinct. The people are here on earth uh, since two million years, while the plants, the ferns, are on the earth for more than 300 million years. And last but, but not least, money was invented 11,000 years ago. And money crashes since then, frequently. I am slightly over 50 years old. I already have two currencies in my lifetime. My parents have three currencies, but still, we are trying to economize the nature and we think that it would be enough evidence to naturalize the economy rather than economize the nature. And this is, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, wetlands all over the world. I took this map from, from Ramsa or, and from, from Banda organization and with the economic values or putting economic values on the wetlands, we are localizing the benefits of ecosystems. Um, we have the fact that uh, a similar wetland in Europe produces higher values than a wetland in uh, Africa, simply because the surrounding economies are higher valued in Europe than, than in Africa. The higher value is not based on the better quality of the wetlands or the, the services the wetlands provide. It's simply because of the uh, better developed um, surrounding. So with this approach, we are localizing the benefits, which is important because it makes the uh, values of the ecosystem more tangible for the people. Still, we think that uh, ecosystems and their services also have global benefits, which we try to, to, to measure. Uh, the core process in nature, in, in the flora, is the photosynthesis. And the main parameter of the photosynthesis are carbon sequestration and the water cycle. 
And these are our main parameters for the intrinsic ecological value. We structure these uh, four parameters in a bookkeeping structure and get from there an index value. Um, in this way, we make sure that natural processes, carbon sequestration and water balance are directly influencing the evaluation of the ecosystem. In this way, we, we can measure the quality of the uh, ecosystems and their services. We only need very limited data and we uh, only use open source data and officially uh, acknowledged and accurate data. And the whole method is quite simple. And uh, in this way, we, we are very transparent. And we refer to scientifically, scientifically proven carbon sequestration data, water models, start, studies, publications, or local assessments. And the surrounding economics and wealth are not relevant, which makes ecosystems comparable globally. And we can measure any time frame, all areas, every spot, uh, all nations, countries in the world. And we also can uh, evaluate uh, industrial sectors, agricultural, bio, uh, organic uh, agriculture versus um, industrial um, agriculture. Um, and we provide very fast and accurate results, which are comparable again globally. Here is one of the uh, application. We apply the intrinsic ecological value on nations, on nations globally. We uh, evaluated each country. And here is an example of Asia where I'm currently uh, located. And in general, we can say that the IV decreases with increasing GDP, which means economic wealth is built on the degradation of ecosystems. You see it here where the red line is the GDP. It increases with a decreasing IV, which reflects the, uh, the remaining um, ecosystems in each country. And with that, we can evaluate the green recovery, which is currently uh, discussed in the international uh, community. After the pandemic, we want to recover in a green way. And with the IEW, we, we can measure that if that actually happens. We have applied um, the IEW on ecosystems like wetland, highland and lowland, forests, savannas, urban areas where we have compared different cities, for instance, so-called green cities versus traditional um, city concepts, and we found out that not all cities which are marketing their self, themselves as green are really green. We uh, evaluated rural areas, as I already said, we compared organic uh, versus industrial agriculture, we uh, evaluated industrial sectors and companies. Last but, but not least, we, we have produced out of these um, intrinsic ecological value, a bankable product for protecting the ecosystems. We consider ecosystems itself or themselves as assets, not only the services, but the ecosystem themselves are already assets. And uh, the intrinsic ecological value produces a monetary incentive, which is based on natural uh, processes. Carbon sequestration and water balance are directly influencing the uh, IEV or the intrinsic ecological value. We can evaluate it daily, which gives us the opportunity to uh, calculate a daily, daily net asset value of an ecosystem. And with this monetary income, we, we can generate a business model of a, uh, of a, of a uh, ecosystem itself. So to summarize it, we can evaluate and compare ecosystems and their benefits globally. It's independent from the surrounding uh, economics. 
that's why we are measuring the quality of the ecosystems. And this could be based on local assessment, but also we, we can refer on, on open source data if no uh, local assessments are available. And we are measuring green recovery and incentives based on natural processes. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to get many questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have overshot the time. So we want to really finalize uh, uh, this uh, webinar. So I kindly ask Dawit only to give us the highlights of his presentation. Highlights, only highlights, because his presentation really builds, culminates from those case studies from the Nile Basin which have been presented. So I only request him to give us highlights for only five minutes, highlights only, and then we will have a brief question and I have uh, very nice questions, very insightful questions to each uh, presenter and then Carlos will wrap it up for us. So please bear with us. Uh, Dawit, please. Just highlights, please. Sorry, uh, I was I was searching my my presentation slide. Yes, David, the only highlights just for five minutes. Uh, um, I can't see my. Um, Sorry, uh, I think my presentation is on my uh, my desk, but I could not able to. Uh, okay, here is it. Just highlights, please. Highlights. Yes. Uh, can you see my my screen now? Yes. Yes. Put it on a presentation mode and only please kindly give us only the highlights. Yes, yes, I will not go through the. Okay, uh, this is the Nile Basin Wetland Tip Synthesis Report. And uh, this is synthesis report is uh, with a structure of uh, seven chapters, uh, having a brief introduction, a reviewing of the evidence, what is there, and the economies and the wetland ecosystems of tip case studies in the Nile Basin. And we do a scoping of TIB in the Nile Basin, and then we build uh, economic case for the wetland conservation, uh, considering the case studies, and also we build assessing of wetland development options. So uh, the introduction is a bit on the challenge and uh, the, the different wetland structure in the Nile Basin. So the TIB synthesis report has two components. We are trying to review the existing knowledge and also we are trying to do the wetland ecosystems, examples of case studies, and also uh, the key roles in guiding, informing, in decision-making, in valuation exercise. And the second component is how we can support wetland conservation measures and management plan and development option, considering the previous five case studies as an example to develop the, the final two chapters. So we conduct peer review, then you can find from the report, uh, the geographical ecosystem and methodological spread of the studies with the scope of economic violation studies. We review around uh, more than 200 research papers and also the distribution of the ecosystem valuation studies in different biomes and also the valuation studies focus and also the application method that is employed in those studies in the Nile Basin areas. Then we find uh, from this review, what are the key knowledge gaps? Uh, there is a skewed in geographical coverage and there is a, a challenge in data and assumption and also a, a limit in the decision-making impacts. So chapter three of the report is more on the biophysical feature of the Nile River Basin, the socioeconomic and development setting, including the whole, the Nile Basin countries, and also the wetland ecosystem and their services. And also we put around 20 case studies as an example in the report. So our chapter four is, does valuation support as a means or a 
to the earth up to the end. How the Nile Basin decision making issues and priorities and themes and topics are supported. What are the policy and practical purposes of wetland ecosystem service valuation is discussed. And then what are the need of valuing and investing in wetland as a natural infrastructure also discussed in this chapter very detailed. So overall, uh, the, the, the report is what is the goal, the, what is the policy purpose, the specific focuses, and who are our target audiences, how uh, we do we can get an entry point and then how we can influence decisions are these are the 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 framework of developing this synthesis report and we have a main report with summary of policy makers and we have also a site level case studies report so for coc tico and simuliki delta we use it for as an input for development of wetland management plan the Reweru Bugesera and the Sud and the Machar wetland, we, we used it for the development of integrated wetland management planning and overall river planning exercises. So from that, uh, we developed the chapter five based on these case studies and how we can use these case studies for transboundary nature and their conservation and management requires a collaboration between more than one countries. So these are the conclusions that you manage from that. So uh, I'm not going into in detail uh, for how we can build case studies of wetland conservation. Uh, and also based on the uh, Sud and Machar and also other case studies, how we can assess the wetland development options in order to boosting the immediate benefits uh, while maintaining the, eco the ecological integrity of, of, and its importance. So for that case, uh, we the green and sustainable development paths as uh, highlighted in the studies for wetland in both suit and uh, uh, DRC wetland studies. So we provide some recommendation how we can use wetland conservation as a development option. We provide uh, conclusion and recommendation uh, based on the findings uh, from both, uh, from the wetland conservation as a management plan and also wetland options for uh, as a development options. So we followed uh, these key steps when you are conducting mainstreaming of TIP in the planning process that is uh, uh, developed by GIZ uh, to provide the recommendation. So sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit very fast, but uh, uh, overall uh, the content of the, the synthesis is uh, containing of uh, these seven major chapters, which gives you a full detailed report uh, that can be of uh, good uh, uh, knowledge and research repository for further studies and as well as also for uh, discussion in our further communications as well. Uh, over to you, Leonard. Thank you very much uh, for my fast presentation. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you, David, for your understanding and uh, delivering your presentation timely. Uh, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all these presentations uh, uh, will be shared with you uh, through uh, the NBDF uh, uh, technical team. And that the reports uh, that were generated from these wonderful and insightful studies are also available, as has been shared by Carlos, they are also available in the Nile Basin Initiative website. So do read them. Uh, even the last presentation by uh, Dawit, uh, there is that report which you can go and read. Now, I kindly ask the presenters, uh, presenter, presenters to open their uh, cameras so that we can have uh, a brief few minutes of, uh, of, of, of discussion. So kindly presenters, open your cameras so that uh, I can uh, shoot these questions and uh, then you can respond. So starting with the first presenter who was Philip, uh, there are many questions which, which have been asked. Kindly try and respond to those questions under Q&A. But Philip, there is uh, a question that is asking that uh, would the study findings be different if the wetland you studied was intact? Because you said 80% of the wetland is under reclamation. So would the, would the study findings be different if it was intact? Please, Philip. Hello. Kindly Definitely, open your... yes. 
Open your camera to make this lively, <laughs> please. Okay, respond, please, Philip. Okay. Hello. Yes, Philip. The air is Definitely. yours, please. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. For in, for instance, uh, we were not able to value carbon sequestration because the wetland is largely degraded. So that's one aspect that definitely would have affected the findings. Two, what we valued were the flows. So when, mm -hmm. we, go, when, when we go to the various development scenarios, then the spatial extent of the wetland now affects the rate at which we will have the terminal end of, of, of the ecosystem services based on, on the kind of development plan that, that is this being discussed. So definitely, if you look at the business of issue or you look at uh, the conservation, then the findings we had were basically the status quo results uh, valuing the, the flow. Then for, for the projected ones, we now went to what is it that is sustainable? So we are banking, we are looking for sustainability based on the spatial extent of the wetland that is, is providing a particular ecosystem service. So it means that if we had a larger extent of the area, then the stock of the particular wetland service will be larger. And therefore the values projected will, will vary, will be different from now that it is 80% uh, degraded. So basically, that, 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 that would have affected the results if the wetland was intact. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much uh, for that answer. Yes, I think uh, there is that element of relation of, between space occupied by these uh, ecosystems and then the associated ecosystem services. Uh, to Monica, uh, there are a lot of studies which have been done that is mapping the ecosystem services and goods of this uh, ecos ecosystem goods and services, the value of ecosystem goods and services. The study you shared on uh, ecosystem services and goods for agriculture center, for agriculture center sector, and also the kind of studies that we have done, but also within our synthesis report, we captured a lot of studies which have mapped uh, the ecosystem services and goods value. Now, the question is this, uh, this is still not finding itself in the natural accounting. These natural assets are still not finding themselves in the natural accounting, uh, in the natural accounting of various counties or of various sectors. Please, why so? And what is missing? What is the gap? Why is this not happening? So that these natural assets can find themselves in the natural uh, account, in the national accounting. Thanks a lot for that question. And actually that's very pertinent because last week, the system of environmental economic accounting, which used to be called experimental economic ecosystem accounting, was approved. It was endorsed by all the member states at, at the UN Statistical Commission. That means that all the countries agreed with a methodology which is going to include ecosystem valuation into a system of national accounts. So this is something that has been piloted in some countries and has being done, especially, for example, for water accounts. So that means that instead of including the value of timber in your system of national accounts, you actually include the value of soil retention, water um, retention, um, carbon sequestration, pollination. I'm going to share with you in the chat the link to this experimental ecosystem accounting, which is not, no longer experimental. But I would say, if I can go back to the reason why this has taken so long, I think a lot of it has to do with how commodification of nature is sometimes considered an issue in the sense that we are not putting a price tag in nature. However, many countries or many um, movements and part of the population do think that we are putting a, a price tag on nature. And that becomes a real issue because if we have an amazing wetland and we say the its value, which is not the same as the price, its value is 10% of the GDP, and then comes a big company and pays that much amount to destroy it. Well, that could be an issue. However, that's not what we're aiming for when we produce our scenarios, which show the trade-offs. So I think that's one of the reasons why it has been slow.
to include these values of ecosystem service into the national accounts. But I think we are on the on the right path. And I hope that studies like these that actually are carried out from the very beginning with the government sectors that are going to apply them will help for this trend to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, for that response. Now on to Professor Haman Musahara. Uh, you have said that uh, when you did your evaluation, this transboundary wetland almost contribute 1.6 GDP into these national economies. I think that is a reasonable, that is huge if we, if we, if we consider this transboundary wetland, 1.6 GDP. And also we are very aware that uh, there's a lot of reclamation in this area, there's a lot of reclamation for agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of degradation. You also mentioned peat, mining of peat for energy and whatever. So why is it so? Uh, having in mind the value of these ecosystem services as you have mapped, why is it that they are not being incorporated and conserved within uh, the investment plans, within the national development plans? And instead we see a lot of degradation and reclamation uh, killing all these uh, ecosystem services and the so-called uh, the 1.6 GDP contribution that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonard. I, I think this is a very interesting uh, question uh, epistemologically and I, I think uh, professionally in relation to planning because, well, the question of whether I expected that I think in terms of magnitude, I expected that because, well, this is a wetland complex, which is not as big, as large as, let us say, the sod that you, 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 you were presented with today. But I think it should be something that can really be of value or make planners and policy makers turn, that there is value there. For example, I think maybe to answer your question specifically, um, well, uh, with a due respect, there must be a gap of knowledge about how valuable, especially the regulatory, uh, regulatory services of ecosystem services that are out there in, in the wetlands. And uh, equally also the value maybe with the time preferences of conserving some uh, areas in the wetlands complex, unless, of course, the figures cannot be to the point. That's why I actually, in my answer, written answer, I was saying, well, personally, I write a lot on the benefit transfer, which sometimes is weak if, if it is transferred to an area which is a little bit different in context and terrain and geography and Rwanda and Burundi are completely different. But I think the figures in relation to to, to the need to have this considered into the planning, into the policy making, are telling, I mean, uh, asking for consideration. And, and th th there between, I think there is also the issue of um, unsustainable use. Of course, when we are talking about interests and what if you talk about uh, uh, people who are of exploiting fish in the Rueru Lake, or let us say people who are investing in a, a lot of uh, uh, rice, uh, agricultural rice, uh, they are, you aut automatically look at encounter or you are pitted against, against trade-offs that have ramifications to water quantity. And we talked about our, our water quality, but I think the issue is, is whether really this should make a case and whether it is worth uh, uh, following, especially if you are talking about the benefits also and the, the, the value of degradation. I agree with you, 1.6 is, is not very, very little, that's very big. And I hope uh, maybe more professionalized on the field studies can come. Okay, maybe okay, this time. okay, Prof. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Prof. Okay, Prof. Uh, the next question is to Ronald. Uh, Ronald, you have talk of intrinsic value uh, in your presentation. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, when you talk of intrinsic value, and then when we look at the, the philosophy behind ecosystem services is more of 
uh, human value, human the benefits of this to the humans. But when we look at intrinsic value, it is the value that you derive by the fact that you exist. Now, how do you marry these two when you're doing your ecosystem services evaluation and ensuring that this intrinsic value are also part and parcel of decision making? Thank you. Thank you for, for this question. Um, yes, the, uh, is it right to, to explain the, the uh, value of the services of the ecosystems are already covered by DEEP? Uh, so I do not see any purpose of uh, bringing in a, an, an alternative method in localizing the uh, economic benefits of ecosystems. We, we are looking at, at the global level and uh, at the quality of the ecosystems, which are not measured but by the economic impact. That's what, what we are trying to do, that, that we are uh, looking at the quality if a ecosystem is functioning or not. And that's reflected in the IAV. And that's why we are complementing the current uh, state of art evaluation methods. We are complementing the total economic value because we are not looking into the uh, economic value, but in, into the ecological value only. We, we separate the economics from the ecology. And I, I try to, to explain that. Why we do that? Because the, the plants, the flora, have a much longer uh, history on our earth than money. So we, we, we look at the more sustainable, more climate resilience patterns rather than the economic patterns. And we, we think we, we have to complement the, the current uh, uh, approach of economizing the, the nature. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, to tell you, tell you your question is rather uh, about how you went doing your evaluation in an area which uh, as, uh, is, in, is not stable. Uh, how did you manage to do your, your, your study? Uh, for instance, in Ituri province, uh, which has got its uh, challenges uh, in terms of communicable uh, diseases, but also in terms of instability. How are you able to, to do this uh, study in that kind of an area? And then uh, the values that you secured, were they the values uh, you expected or they were, they were low or they were, they were high? Yes, tell me briefly so that uh, we wind up, please. Thank you very Valuted. much uh, for this. No, I'm okay now, Ivo. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Leonard and the, and the colleagues for the question. Uh, actually, I outline uh, uh, those uh, points you, you, you raise as some of the constraints to really doing maybe a better defined study uh, and we, uh, we, I present it as a, as a challenge. But uh, to tell you, uh, yes, it really is a very challenging place to, to do a study like this uh, right now because of the security challenges, but also these diseases, as you say. But there's a lot of uh, transient uh, movement of the populations. Uh, somehow the populations are, are very homogeneous, the people on the Ugandan side and the people on the other side. So I relied on uh, uh, interviews with the Congolese who have moved on this side. Uh, actually, one of my respondents is, uh, uh, is a, a, a chief, a political administrative leader in Congo, who happened to be residing in Uganda right now, and he had some of the necessary records. Uh, so we went through the population, some of the ecosystem service production levels and so on. And uh, okay. I was able to construct, construct a, a fairly clear picture uh, from his narrations and his uh, uh, official documents that he held uh, on the Congo side, but okay. uh, while living okay. in Uganda. Okay, thank you, Telly, and uh, sorry for rushing this. Uh, just the final question, and then we sum it up. Uh, this is to Jamal and Dawit. Uh, tourism or cultural services, specifically tourism, is not captured in your study for Sud and Mashal. Does it mean that this service is not there? 
or if service is there but it's not being exploited does it mean you can't measure it so why is tourism which is a potential service in this area not measured in your studies thank you okay yeah uh, i think uh, i gave a floor for jamal to reflect on that but uh, there is a potential but you know the current situation of the south sudan uh, and also the infra infrastructural facilities uh, to access uh, some of the areas uh, in the wetland areas may limit. Uh, uh, so these are the two reasons, but uh, I do agree with, especially uh, the Sud wetland is a high potential for uh, tourist attra attractiveness. So uh, let me give for Jemar to reflect on that point. But my point is it has a potential, but due to very limited visit of the, uh, the areas because of the infrastructure and the current situation of the country, we may underestimate the value. That's why we keep ourselves from mentioning, uh, but we mentioned in the report the potentiality of the, for tourism and cultural services. Over to yeah. you, Jamal. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Darius. I think my, Response is uh, similar with that of Dawit because, uh, as we know, tourism, especially for Sud, we say that it's uh, a wetland of uh, importance, uh, international importance, uh, which is uh, registered under the Ramsar Convention. And it has also huge uh, biodiversity, uh, uh, you know, uh, within the wetland. So, but as Dawit said, we know the local uh, situation in South Sudan now, and because of that, uh, let alone uh, uh, tourists from abroad, even the local communities are uh, not settled very well, and uh, there are also poor infrastructure. So because of these issues, we were not able to capture uh, uh, the tourism service, but it has huge potential to take it. Over to you. I think your mic is muted. Leo, you are muted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, our presenters, and thank you so much, our uh, audience. I will now call upon my colleague uh, Juan Carlos to summarize, uh, give the key messages, and then we'll call it a day for this webinar. Please, uh, Carlos, please. Yes, Leo, thank you so much. And of course, thank you so much to the participants and to uh, all the people that have made the webinar possible. I think a couple of points. First, start to starting by by thanking our our donor who has made all of these uh, uh, studies and research possible. The uh, climate change initiative of the Ministry of Environment of Germany, who has sponsored not only the keep a, a part of our project, but also a, all of all, all of all those other studies that you have been hearing during these series of webinars, including peatlands baseline studies and much more that we have uh, discovered last week and we will continue all the way until until tomorrow. Um, I think there's a couple of things that, uh, that, that have been said that they already put the relevance of ecosystems and specifically wetlands ecosystems over the over the, the, the table and highlight the importance of this uh, of these landscapes. Will not go into the details, but if you uh, start putting all the figures together, you come to, 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 to the conclusion that wetland ecosystem services are key when you're making those trade-offs on how to develop the different options of a, a, a environment and water resources within small catchments, within sub-catchments, and throughout the, uh, the Nile Basin. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to, to highlight as we close down is, uh, first of all, the importance of partnerships. So during this journey, we have wor worked together with UNEP, with IUCN, with wetlands, and of course, with, uh, with the different countries. We have worked with a lot of different researchers, individuals, professors, and uh, this has created a, a small community of practice that it's uh, now thriving and it's there and we are all part of it. So I think that's that's a very important uh, additional element to the one of knowledge creation that we have a, a, a seen throughout and, and during the last couple of years. So thank you to all of you that, uh, that have 
willingly uh, contributed to that community of practice. The other one that I wanted to highlight is that the, these studies in itself, they, they are not an end in itself. They have contributed to different processes, many of them uh, to policy and decision-making. Many of them have influenced the management plans that we have uh, already discussed in a previous webinar. That's the case, for example, on the CEO, that's the case on the Samliki, but also there's a, other processes that are still ongoing, for example, on, Manch on Machado or, or in the case of the Sud. So just to highlight that this is not a, 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 an academic exercise and that we're happy with the knowledge created. This is, of course, very great, but uh, put it in perspective that these are inputs to management processes uh, that are, of course, very key. Another uh, interesting thing that I think it's worth uh, uh, recalling is the fact that we are talking about transboundary. So that complexity of managing ecosystems, of course, is there. But now under this project, we have uh, ventured into, into a second layer of, of, of difficulty, which is uh, managing ecosystems of a transboundary nature. So that one is quite special and unique to this set of a, a studies that, a, that we were a, a analyzing, analyzing today. The last one is the, the way forward. I think we have heard from, from, from UNEP and from the GIZ colleague, very interesting future approaches. I think a, a, as we a move forward, I think we might have a look into the synthesis report to understand the different methodologies or the different countries or even the different ecosystem services where there's still a much a deeper need for, for further research. But as we do that, also to take into account a couple of those new input, uh, inputs, approaches that we have heard today. So thank you once again, Leo. Thank you for all the participants and back to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And this marks uh, the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Let's keep the fire burning, uh, the fire of wetlands and their values or ecosystems.